Ray, who is a registered nurse, and he's predominantly worked in the mental health field. Uh, during those years, Ray has uh, developed a knowledge and passion for uh, speaking and sharing with his friends and colleagues, and uh, has adapted a uh, the Brian Tracy and Anthony Robbins uh, continuous and never-ending improvement. Uh, see, he has incorporated that philosophy into his everyday living and is quite willing to bring it out and share it with his friends and family and, and his quest for knowledge and understanding. And uh, he's not quite sure how it happened, but he woke up one morning and realized that he was a senior himself. And uh, so he's been, he's here to kind of share some of his knowledge with us. So welcome Ray Stonehouse. Thank you, Julian. Yes, we're going to be talking about the top five strategies for adding abundance to your life as a senior. Now, I've, I mentioned that to my, I had a friend named Dennis, and I was talking to Dennis, and I told him that I was going to be doing a presentation on this particular subject. And Dennis says, absolutely no way, there's no way you can add life, uh, you can add abundance to your life as a senior without several million dollars in, in the bank. Now, Dennis, He's a retired, he retired young, he retired from real estate. And the way Dennis looks at abundance is based on money. Now there's a lot more to abundance than focusing on money. And this is what we're going to focus on in this particular presentation. So there's two aspects to what we're talking about. We're talking about seniors and we're talking about abundance. Now we have, how many seniors do we have in the room here? We have, do we have some? <laughs> Do you remember when you turned, you became a senior? Do you remember that? Is it, is it fresh in your memory? Yeah, that's, part, that's part of the challenge, is that we have this idea that anybody over 50 years old is perhaps a senior. And some, I'm not even too sure what the rule is on, on when you become a senior. I found out the hard way, it, and I have to tell you, it, it really knocked the wind right out of my sails. It, it happened out here in, in West Bank, where we are right now, West Side. I was on my way to work. I work in Penticton. And I dropped off at the local Tim Hortons. And I had one of those uh, discount cards, $5 discount cards. And I ordered a cup, of, a cup of coffee and ordered a couple donuts. So the young girl behind the counter, she says, that will be uh, $3.98 and you saved 59 cents for your senior's discount. And all of a sudden I go, what? Senior's discount? Then all of a sudden, three different thoughts came into my mind as a whirlwind right away. First thought I thought was, how does Tim Hortons possibly know that I just turned 55 three days ago? You know, it's a $5 gift card. There's absolutely no way that they should know anything about this. This is getting ridiculous that the government knows so much information about you. That this should not be happening. But then I thought, no, it was a gift card. So they, the people that gave me the gift card, they don't even know how old I was. So that absolutely couldn't have happened. But then I thought, well, wait a minute. This young girl behind the counter, she thinks because I've got a few gray whiskers in my beard that I must be an old fart and I must be a senior citizen. And that was even worse than the paranoia that people knew how old I was and more information about me. But then, then even more importantly, a third thought came into my mind. And she said, and with your senior's discount, and that was the part that I focused on, I actually saved 59 cents using my senior's discount when I turned 55. Now this was two years ago, I'm 57 plus now, and since then I've had a couple opportunities to use that senior's discount. I saved about probably four or five hundred dollars on a window purchase that I had at the local Rona in Kelowna. So that senior's discount, I'm, I'm really happy with that. So we're, we're talking about seniors, we tend to think about people that are 55 years old and older. Well, that's a long range. I think most of us know that when we're talking about, we have a newborn. You're a newborn for how long? About a year? You become, what's after that? You come into a toddler stage, infant. So those are definite periods of time. You get into your the early childhood up until you're a teenager. Then you become, I guess there's something now called preteens. 
I'm not sure what they call them. So you're a range in there. Then you're a teenager from 13 to 19, 20 to 30. You're, you're a young adult. You're getting out experiencing the world. You're still a young adult at probably 25 to 30. Then all of a sudden you're into middle adult range, 30 to, to 45. 45, you're middle adult. And all of a sudden, around 50, even though you're not considering yourself a senior, the gray hair starts to come forward in places, maybe thinnings, that happens to some people earlier. But you don't necessarily think of yourself as a senior, but other people start to think of you as a senior. And that seems to be what the turning point is. So at about 55 years, it seems the local stores they have decided that 55 is a magical number and they start giving seniors discount. The bulk food stores, different uh, stores give you a discount. So, not too sure how that happens, where they have so much power to determine who actually is a senior. They, the statistics say that if you are a 65-year-old man right now, that statistically you are going to live until you're 82 years old. So if you're 65 now, statistically you'll live until you're 82. They won't put that in writing though, and they won't give you any guarantees, so you're really on your own as to, as to how well you're going to last. But what that means is, if you're 65 now, 65, 75, you've got another 15 years ahead of you, and here in the Okanagan where we have such a high demographic of older people, the odds are you will live longer than that. So if it takes you 50 years to become a senior, and you could live to 100, 103, who knows what's going to happen at that age, half of your life is really living as a senior. And yet our whole society is based on, on younger people. Everything is based on, directed towards the younger, the younger person. And yet half of our population is over the age of 50. So in time, we know, if people live, we know that every single one of them is going to be a senior. So, a senior is a, is a broad range. Now I'm going to introduce the concept of abundance. Now, the example I gave before, I talked about my friend Dennis. Now Dennis related to abundance to having a lot of money in the bank, and when you have the money, you're able to do a lot more things. In many ways, Dennis is right in that regard. If you do have the money in the bank, you can do a lot of things. But not everybody has the money, but many people still are able to attract abundance into your life. Now abundance is a concept that I find that I, 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 it's based on a select group of people that I've asked that I don't think they really clearly understand the term what abundance is. Anybody here have any ideas about how you would describe abundance in relationship to what we're going to be talking about? Lots. 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 Well, I, that's a good idea. Lots of abundance. It seems like a simple definition. But the way I look at it is Okay, we just, this past week, some of us celebrated the American Thanksgiving. It was a good reason to cook a turkey up, so I celebrated Thanksgiving. Some people celebrated a great cup for Thanksgiving. Uh, we, had our, we had our Canadian Thanksgiving just back in October. And when you see Thanksgiving, you see that, uh, you know, that horn of plenty that you, also, you always quite often see. And Thanksgiving, I guess, was developed once upon a time because we were an agricultural-based economy. So the farmers, it would be the end of the growing season. They would bring everything to harvest. They celebrate with what they had. And at the end of the season, quite often, there's a lot of root crops. That You see the horn of plenty, what they call the cornucopia, and you see veg vegetables coming out of it in abundance. And that's what really abundance is, is having lots of, lots of things in your life that you are grateful for. It's not necessarily about having more stuff, you know, having more possessions than somebody else does, but it's having more good things in your life that you can be grateful for. So that's what really abundance is about, is being grateful. So what we have is a, a short presentation here, that it's PowerPoint, so we're going to go through the slides, and I'm going to illustrate how that I believe that as seniors, myself in there, not as I say, my introduction, I'm not too sure how that happened, that kind of snuck up on me, I still remember my 40th birthday, so how the 57th birthday came into that, I'm not too sure how that happened. This isn't based on any scientific. This, this, is, this is the world according to Ray Stonehouse. This is, as my introduction, I've worked, I've worked nursing for a long time. I've worked in uh, 
nursing going over 34 years and then most of that I worked in psychiatry. So I work with people on a day-to-day -day basis. So the things that we come up with uh, are my view of the life that, that I think that if I apply them to my life, I'm going to live a life of abundance, and that's the reason I'm sharing with everyone here. So you need a reason to get up in the morning. For some people, it's to go to the bathroom. <laughs> you know, that's really it is. That's the reason to get up. But you need to have some. You have, need to have more than that. There has to be a purpose to get up in the morning. I work in uh, a psychiatric facility in mental health. Many of my people have depression. Now, if you, I'm not going to ask you if you have depression, but perhaps you know somebody with depression. So depression affects people. It's like having a wet black blanket over top of their head and trying to look through at life through a, 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 it's a negative force around you. And everything is negative. You cannot see any light. You can't see any enjoyment. You can't see any, any, anything good in life. Everything is apathetic. People get up in the morning and they have no plans for the day. So one of the things I have to do first thing in the morning, and I've done it year after year because that's what my job is, I pass morning medication. People come out to get their medication at 8 o'clock in the morning. And some of them are half awake, some are half asleep, some haven't had their coffee yet, some, some are you know, really in a fog or in a blanket, this black blanket, and some are really depressed. So the people that, that are really depressed, one of the things that I have to do as a registered nurse is I very much have to, we have multiple roles. As a registered nurse, I'm a teacher, I'm a caregiver, I'm a nurturer. I, I have to be a, not a disciplinarian person, but I have to be in charge. I have to run, run the facility. You wouldn't think of it as a nurse. I also have to be a cheerleader. Now, I want you to think about me in my little outfit and my, my pom-poms. And you know, I, I didn't wear that. Don't, don't think I haven't worn one, though. But I have to encourage my patients, my residents, to try and change their mindset, to think about something else in life. So quite often when they get up, I ask them how they're doing. I say, what do you have planned for today? Well, nothing. My stock response to that is, well, how do you know when you're done? I think, well, I never thought about that. So what I do when I work with them, I, it's, it's not a matter of trying to get them to smile, but it's trying to get them to think of something else in their life besides feeling sorry for themselves. And that often happens with depression. It almost sounds like a joke, but depression is depressing. It really is. It's, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you are depressed, you will become depressed. And then everything that you look at. So one of the big important things is having something to get up for in the morning. Now, I'm still actively working. I'm a, probably a workaholic. I get great enjoyment out of, out of working, taking on creative projects taking on something different every day. So when I get up first thing in the morning, even when I get up in the middle of the night to check out the, the bathroom, my mind starts working on my to-do list. I have to purposely turn it off. But for some people, and this whole presentation is, is uh, geared towards seniors, is that when you no longer have a job, you know, a, a going to work every day, earning an income, and many seniors do work, uh, I want to say that jobs aren't necessarily related to money. Jobs can be create, or related to what you do in life. But if you don't have something to get up and go to, your life can be so empty. Many seniors nowadays, with the way the families have changed, we're having, we call them boomerang kids. Our children grew up, they bid the 30s, they went out, all of a sudden they're back home again. They're living with families and seniors our age as grandparents, we're now raising our children's children. So for some people, that does give them a reason to get up. Well, I was talking to one woman, it gives her a reason to get up at four in the morning. You know, three kids under five. That's not what I would want to do for a reason to get up. But people need a reason to get up in the morning. It could be some people have hobbies. Some people are, are they do volunteer work in the community. It could be volunteer work in your, your faith, your church getting out and helping somebody else. It's really a matter of finding where your interests are and getting out there and sharing with other people, networking with other people perhaps, finding out where you can fit in and help other people. And I think that one of the ways to take some pressure off you, if you get up in the morning, what am I going to do? I've got a friend named Jim and he's retired. 
and you said he told me he worked hard all his life, and now that he's retired, he says the most challenging question or the most challenging decision he has to make in the morning is what time he's going to have his morning nap. Then he says his afternoon nap just happens on its own. <laughs> that's what he says. I don't, I don't know if that's true or not. He's, he's down in Palm Springs right now, so I think he's maybe doing something a little more you know, different than what we are. Many people find that it takes the pressure off you what you're going to do in the morning if you make that decision what you're going to do the night before. So if you're going, coming from a perspective of, of gratefulness, perhaps reflecting when you go to bed. Some people pray. Some people talk to themselves, but that's, you know, that's a whole other issue, is to, to have some self-talk as to what, worked, what went well today. What, need to be, what is there to be grateful about? What can I do tomorrow? Perhaps what can I do to help myself tomorrow? What can I do to add value to somebody else's life? And I think that's a good thing to add to, uh, to abundance or any age, but uh, certainly for seniors, it's in the right direction here. Can't wait to see what's up next. Okay, the law of attraction. Now, sometimes this is a new concept. Does anybody here, heard, you heard of the law of attraction? No? You heard of law of attraction? Mm -hmm. how, how about you, Phil? You heard of law of attraction? Mm -hmm. okay. You probably have. You probably have, but you probably haven't heard of it in that term there of the law of attraction. The law of attraction is a law like gravity, whether you believe in gravity or not. It's there. We don't even think about gravity. As long as gravity's working, we're fine. We don't even give a second thought. But if it wasn't working, all of a sudden everything in this room would start to be going weird. We started to be floating. Now the law of attraction has probably been around since, probably since the time somebody thought of it and said, let's create a law of attraction. What you probably know it as is what you think about comes about. You create your own reality. You heard those kind of thoughts before? Henry Ford, who was the auto manufacturer, you know, invented the Ford cars back around the turn of the century, he had a saying that says, whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're right. So if you think you're going to have a bad day when you get up in the morning, guess what? You are going to have a bad day. That's a self that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. I don't know, my mother like many mothers, would have superstition. There's some things that you don't do. You probably know some of them, you know, the, the salt shaker falls over, you got to, like it's over the right shoulder, you had to do something. If a knife fell to the floor, that means a man was coming to visit, a fork was a woman, a spoon was, well, maybe my, maybe my family was a little bit weird. But the other things that she did was, you don't talk about something bad. You don't talk about something in a negative way, because it might happen. And that's in the belief that it's a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. So that's looking at the law of attraction from a negative way. You know, don't do something, you don't touch wood, or you ever see those, you've heard those expressions before? What you're trying to do is you're neutralizing the bad thought. Well, if the law of attraction works on the negative side, the law of attraction also works on the positive side. And I know for a fact that it works. I've had, I, I could easily do a three hour session just on the law of attraction, on things that I put out into the world that have come back to me in abundance and have added to my life. I have I put out that I was looking for more speaking opportunities several years ago, and now they're they're coming they're coming fast and furious. Today I will have three speaking opportunities from this morning the networking session, uh, presenting here this afternoon, and then one this evening. So n these kind of opportunities are are coming my way. I put out to the world that I wanted uh, positive people that were able to to add to my life that I was able to give to their life those opportunities are coming my way fast and furious. I put out there that I'm hoping that money's going to come my way in abundance. It's not coming as fast and furious as I would like it to, but it's out there and I know that it's when I'm ready for it, and I'm, and I'm ready for it, that the money will start coming in. So the law of attraction is going to be working whether you think about it or not, or whether, whether you think it's not going to or not. So you can control that to a certain extent. So the idea would be to, to put positive thoughts out there, your universe is listening anyways, so you might as well put the positive thoughts. Uh, it, can, it can be very scary how powerful it was. I hadn't planned on this in the presentation, but I'm driving a new truck right now because of the law of attraction. I had truck envy. I was in, a, I was in an intersection in Kelowna 
two years ago, and a nice shiny red truck went by. And I thought, geez, wouldn't it be nice to have a nice new truck? Within 10 days, I was driving a new truck. And all that had to happen was, I had to leave Penticton at 7 o'clock in the morning, driving home from night shift, hit some black ice, spin around three times, smash into a ditch, have the wheels fall off my truck, my windshield smashed, my truck totaled, and I was driving a new truck. I joke about sometimes that I, I could be an entrepreneur and sell these uh, uh, tinfoil helmets to keep the universe from, from reading people's brains. So the universe is listening, so you have to be careful. You have to be careful what you're thinking. So the law of attraction is working. So you create your own reality. So the last sentence there is really profound. What's your current reality? Are you happy with what you have in life? Could you be doing something different? Could you be helping something, some other people? So you need balance in your life. I think some people understand balance better than others. I, this is my, it's not based on any science. I tend to think that women understand balance better than what men do. Men, we go to work, we come home, we go to work, we come home. And that, even that's generalizing, but I know a lot of men have said that. Their entire life has been working and going home. The wife has looked after the, the child rearing, raising the family, doing the housework, and now many of them, of course, having their own careers, second, I wouldn't say second, second income, it's second income, yes, but in many cases, it's first income, because we also have single parent families. So the, the wife, the woman is going out there as the bread earner, and they still have all these jobs to do when they come home. So they understand balance. To them, balance is a juggling act. I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I've got to do this. So what happens is, many men, when they retire, their, their identity or their persona throughout their working career has been based on what they do for a living. Now I used to introduce myself, hi I'm Ray Stonos, I'm a registered nurse. Because that's what I saw myself as a registered nurse. As a man, we tend to view ourselves as what we do for a living. Now quite often when I ask people, when I'm meeting new people, I ask them what it did, they do for a living. I ask you Phil what you did for a living. Because it helps give me a reference to what that person has. And it, it, it is a quick generalizing because the person tells me what they do, that doesn't really de define the profession, it doesn't define that person, but it gives me a reference point where I have something in common to build upon with those people. My father, as an example, worked in a factory his entire life. It's a bartending, but he was in a factory. And he was in a position, he was in a union position, and people used to go to him to solve problems. And he got his identity based out of that. He tended to be kind of a, when you think of the bad ways unions are, the heavyweights, the, the, that's exactly what he was, and, and unfortunately. But that's the way his, his persona, that's how he viewed himself. So when he retired, he didn't have that part of his life anymore. So the only union people he had to deal with the management was his wife, which was my mother. So you can imagine it was, it was the battling Bickersons. How many men are the same way? I'm talking... Yeah, you know, I do a lot of networking, I'm talking to a lot of older gentlemen, and I'm seeing more and more fellows that have retired and have gone back to work, have retired, have created their own business, have retired and retired and retired, and still, because the first year of retirement, the garage is clean, uh, the house is clean, the yard is done, and once they start rearranging the kitchen cupboards, the wife says, you're back to work, you have to find something to do. So balance in life, you know, we think of it as a teeter-totter. And we know when we're out of balance, but we don't always know when we're in balance. So what, what makes life in balance? Any idea what would add to uh, balance in your life? Um, what would add to balance? No, what are you doing Sunday? I just have what are you doing Sunday? Time, time for myself. Mm -hmm time for yourself, but are, are, do you go to church? I go to church, yeah. Quite often, people's faith, their denomination, that adds a balance to their life. It gets them, it gets them touch of their spiritual side. It gives them, it gives them some time with family, some friends, something for people that have something in common, uh, some happy times, uh, balancing it out with, you know, some of the workload side of things. We, and we get so easily we get bogged down with, you know, what we do. 
you, what do you do, Bill, for balance there? I get up for balance. I get up fairly early in the morning, and that's my quiet time. I turn the TV on, no sound, and I have my coffee, and just sit there and just totally relax. That and actually, that's a very popular one. I know when I was when I was working more often, I had a job that was more of a Monday to Friday style job, and getting up early, having that cup of coffee, or reading the newspaper, you know, even that 20 minutes to half an hour downtime to, to recharge. Mm -hmm. Now I find my downtime is if I stop, if I stop thinking, I fall asleep right away. So my, my downtime is actually, is actually sleeping. I think this is a big one for any age, let alone seniors. You got to exercise your brain. More and more scientific research is coming out that, you know, the old story: you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, you can't. Not not that any of us as seniors are old dogs, but we can be taught new skills. More and more seniors are taking on educational programs. I don't know if it still exists, but there is a program that I've had several of my friends have been involved here in the Okanagan called Oiler. Has anybody heard of Oiler? It stands for Okanagan Learning in Retirement, and uh, I would I would consider I would strongly suggest checking it out because I'm not sure if it even still exists. But what Euler is is basically a group like this. The group would get together, and one person in that group would serve as a teacher. But it's a very much an informal educational program. So let's just say you had, a, as an example, say you had an interest an interest in the Canadian Constitution. So you would go out and you would research everything that you knew about the Canadian Constitution, then you would come back to your group of, of fellow seniors and you would do a classroom presentation on everything that you learned on that particular. So it's an informal way of learning. In some ways it reminds me, like I'm very strong in Toastmasters, so it's very, very similar to what we do there on a smaller version. But uh, a person would research any given subject of interest and come back and field a question and answer period to their to their fellow students. So what that does for you, one, it gets you continues to network, you have a chance to meet with people. It also keeps your brain active because you're doing research and nowadays of course we have we've got computer, we've got access to the internet. The the world is truly at our fingertips. Truly the, the information it is you know the information highway, it is out there, the information. And you could literally spend your entire life logged onto a computer getting more information, that's according to what my wife says anyways. That's that's why that's where I get out of balance is too much time on the on the on the computer. Things like reading books. Reading books, perhaps listening to radio shows, watching I'm not too sure what to think about television. Television, there's pros and there's cons. Does it exercise your brain? Any thoughts? Would you agree do you think it exercises your brains? Yes and no. Yes and no. Depends on what you watch. Yeah, I, I, I'm very much into quality over quantity. I don't watch American sitcoms. I think they're absolute banal. They're a total waste of my time. Yet I do like British sitcoms because there's a difference there. They they laugh at the situation rather than picking on the person. And I don't like that style of humor. So that's a balance. Having a good laugh in your life, you know, gets you thinking. Some of the National Geographic shows or documentaries where I learned something or something, uh, a documentary that, that I don't have any knowledge about. So that would be exercising my brain. Uh, crossword puzzles, jigsaw puzzles, those ones that have been, uh, well, world, word jumbles, I don't understand those ones. My mother likes doing them. I don't, you know, you got to find a word and, and I find them, I don't know, not as much fun as she does. <laughs> uh, Sudoku. Those ones I don't quite understand that I've tried doing. You familiar with Sudoku? Yeah. I don't quite understand those. It's trying to find words and using up so many. But what they do is they use your they use your your mental faculties. So the more you practice, the more skill you use it, you know, our brain cells don't reproduce. We don't get any new ones as we get older. We get less, but we can still increase our intelligence. And I I haven't got the research in my hand, but they're saying that the more you use it, the less chance that you have of developing a dementia, like Alzheimer's. Or do you have any comments on that, Joanne? Since you, I've I've heard that also, but um, by by being more active, 
but it certainly helps alleviate some of that. And diet's another big mm -hmm. thing that uh, that's huge. So use it or lose it. Now, be proactive about your health. Now, I'm a registered nurse, so you can expect that somewhere along the line there had to be something in here about healthcare. And you're, you're going to like this part here. <laughs> so we found out at our last presentation is that, as I say, this is my belief. We have a illness system. We call it a health system. But it's not a health system. It's totally based on illness. Because when you are ill, you need treatment. You need help. Places like drugstores, places like uh, pharmacies, drugstores, uh, doctors, those are the places you go to when you are ill. Government, the health care plan, health care plan, only pays to get treatment when you are sick. If you want to go to assist to, to a health care practitioner when you are well, perhaps a, a holistic practitioner, you're going to have to pay for that on your own. Because our health care system pays for sickness. Now, there's a lot of money involved in the health care system. Big Pharma. Not, not a pharmacy store, Big Pharma. Big Pharma is, is what you would consider the drug developers. They are the companies that create new drugs, they market new drugs. Now, I think many of us perhaps that have grown up in our generation, we've had this belief that mankind is developing to the point that the drug company and healthcare is going to improve that we're going to live till we're 120 years old. We're going to live till we're 130 years old because all these ailments of mankind have been cured. Well, that's not what's happening up there. It's been a, a monetization of the entire system. The drug companies aren't so much interested in solving our problems. They're not so much interested in curing. They're interested in selling us their cure. So their mandate, when you like to think that it's a very altruistic mandate to solve all the problems of mankind, cure plague, cure all of them, it's not. They are to have a, re, a good, positive, solid return of investment for their shareholders. They want you to continue to buy their medication. And they're getting very desperate at trying to find ways to make it work. All of a sudden, one of the things that they're doing now, and you know, as, as a pharmacy, you'll know that you have drug reps come in on an on a ongoing basis. They have massive budgets to be able to support their, their uh, medications that they have. If you go to any medical practitioner or doctor, they would likely have a room the size of this that is just full of free samples. And the more that they give the free samples, there are perks for them. So there's, there's kind of a, a conflict of interest. And yet, on the other side of it, we have a, an alternative health care system where we have, I did some research on it, and there are some 26 different fields of alternative medicine that are not considered mainstream. So what that means is that they don't get funding through the government. Now some of the ones that might surprise you, surprise me, chiropractors. Did you know that chiropractors are not considered mainstream medicine? They're still considered complementary medicine? So you get into that whole field of uh, uh, hypnotherapy, Reiki, uh, reflexology, ear candling, I still wonder about that one. Uh, there were some 26 different uh, uh, fields of alternative healthcare medicine that people have available to them. And for whatever reason, BC statistically is more likely, as a citizen of BC is more likely to try out alternative medicine than anywhere else in the country. I think Quebec might have been the, been the second one. So we are open to these kind of ideas in our, in, our, in our province. So being proactive. Well, not everybody has a healthcare background. Not everybody's a nurse or a social worker, a psychologist, a doctor. Quite often, many people have a nurse or healthcare person in their family, so they've got somebody to go to. Now, this whole presentation is geared towards seniors. What about that senior living out in the community? Who have they got to go for? Who can they talk to if they don't have somebody in their family? They have to go to their doctors. Now, I'm talking specifically about the generation of seniors that are older than me. My belief, and I could be generalizing, but what I have found is that the generation older than me tends to look at their physician as gods. And 
conversely, the doctors of that that age tend to think of themselves as gods too. So if you went to your doctor and said, you know, I'm not sure about this, they say, take a pill. Take a pill because I say take a pill. So there's quite often not a lot of dialogue. And as I say, that's stereotyping somewhat. A lot of doctors are like that, but a lot of the newer generation of doctors are not like that. And there are older doctors that are that are quite often will say, you know, if you need a second opinion, I've got a colleague, we'll send you to get a second opinion. They're open to that. Others, their ego gets tied into it. But that's human nature. That's not really fair to pick on doctors. But you need to be proactive on yourself. We are in the information age, the information highway. Computer, we can you can punch in almost any ailment or disorder or symptom that you'll have and you'll find some information on it. The problem is that if you don't have a healthcare background, you don't have the ability to filter out the quality of the material that you're seeing. And there is a, they call it garbage in, garbage out. There is a lot of garbage that is on the internet. You think you're following something, you think it looks very interesting, and then you get right down to the bottom of the page, and the whole thing that it's designed to is to sell you a product. Some of the drug companies, I know for a fact, because I, I have a website to do with nursing, and I was approached by somebody wanting to, be, to put something on about sexual health. And I was really reluctant to do it because I, I didn't really see how that tied into the website that I had. But I did research on it, and I found out that the company has about 150 different websites that they're using, we call landing pages. The idea is that they're not selling anything, but they are, they are an international, multinational pharmacy company online, and they're just going around all these different websites trying to, trying to, to draw traffic. So the information that they had, it might have been valuable, but I don't know about what they're trying to do for me. Are they trying to get marked? You know, I'm into marketing, so I understand that. But I don't like the, the sneakiness part of it. And there's some, there's some absolute bad information that's also out there. So you really have to be careful. Some of the, it's called anecdotal. I guess when you're, when you're talking about medical treatment, you're talking about medication, uh, drugs, uh, ideally your drug will have been tested by a double bind study, meaning that somebody else has tested it and they have backed up what it's supposed to do. A lot of the stuff that comes out there has not been that way. So some of the ideas can be extremely dangerous for you. So proactive about your health, you can talk to your doctor. Even nowadays, prints, if you have some concerns that your doctor's not talking to you about, and you find something on the internet, I'd say print it out, bring it into your doctor and say, you know, I've, I've, I found this on the internet, don't say, I wouldn't say, suggest saying, no, I want you to do something about it. I would say, what do you think about this? Because that's what's happening in the U.S. That's why the Americans, they have their, their uh, drug ads on, the, on TV, where we don't have drug ads up here. People are going in, I want this drug. It doesn't work that way up here. But take it in, have a dialogue with your doctor. So that's really where the proactive part is. If you don't have a nurse or doctor in your family, is finding somebody in your, your, your uh, network who is able to help you with that. And that's really the whole segue into, right into uh, what Joanne is here for. Uh, Joanne's business with uh, Caring for You Support Services. What Joanne does is that she helps, she's being proactive for people, for seniors, that don't have the resources, they don't have the networks, and she's a community resource that this is what she does. Are we going to show the video now, or do you want to speak? Or? Oh, yeah, Let's show the video. Just go to side, don't touch. Right there. There you go. Oh, it works. Do you want to turn the camera on there? You have to turn up way well, actually, on the other My name is Lois Waitman, and I am living now in Kelowna. I have traveled across uh, Canada. First of all, I started in, in Winnipeg, but then, after I got married, moved to Montreal. That is a very beautiful city. It reminds me, or Kelowna reminds me much of the place where I live, uh, in a small settlement outside of Montreal proper. Uh, I grew up, as I said, in um, a small town in Ontario, just east of Winnipeg. A lot of skiing, skating, those, those activities are now 
finished for me, and I have had to think about other things that would keep me busy, occupied, so that I did not get lonely. I moved in to a senior's settlement, all about my same age, or maybe a little older. We get along great. There are a lot of activities. Uh, I think right now I have no place for me to go. This is where I will end my days. Uh, not that I'm in any hurry, but I have met Joanne, who is of care with caring for you, and she has introduced me to James. I either see once a week, I see either one of them, and we go on picnics or just to drive. I uh, have been to a dance with James, and we got along very well, although he told me he didn't know how to dance. I couldn't believe it because to me, he led very well. And I, I don't know whether I pushed him around a little bit, maybe I did, but anyway, we got along fine, and I'm waiting for him to ask me to go again. But he does have a wife, and I can't steal his time. Perhaps he has a friend my age, a little difficult, because he's, he's nice and young. But when I say nice and young, do not get the idea that I miss being young, for I do not. Sometimes there is a loneliness, but all I have to do is go across to the estate house and there's always somebody there, or I phone Joanne. And she either sends, she either comes to my rescue herself, or she sends James. Whatever the reason, whatever, it doesn't make a, ma a matter which it is. We always have fun. There's always what I like to call fun and games. It doesn't matter who I'm with. I enjoy the company of the young and old. informative and, yes, and, and uh, Thank you. got some good information from it and um, services that uh, Caring for You offers. We, uh, we are very proactive into um, uh, helping seniors maintain a level of independence, uh, being proactive in health, making sure that we have a uh, eat a healthy diet is very important to us and uh, you know, so we want to make sure that you're getting your proteins and your vegetables and, and that sort of thing. That's um, we have been doing some studying into uh, a program called the Daniel Plan, and uh, there's three doctors that are involved in that: Dr. Amon, Dr. Oz, and uh, Dr. Who's the other doctor? Amon, Oz, and Amon, and uh, they're leading doctors in. Their, their own fields and it just uh, explains that even through diet we can reverse a lot of our health issues. Uh, the other thing is that it can reverse Alzheimer's. And so it's, you know, we uh, work with people to help them avoid the feelings of loneliness. Respite care is a thing too, you know, that uh, people need a break and you can't do it all by yourselves and so you have to ask for help and sometimes that's a little difficult for people to do but it's um there's help out there so i want to thank you for coming and um thanks again ray for your for your time i really really appreciate it and um if there's any questions and i'm available